In one of the greatest healthcare achievements in our lifetimes, in less than 12 months after the emergence of a novel coronavirus pandemic, we have not one, but several vaccines getting approved by regulators around the world. But as Professor Danny Altman pointed out in my last film on the subject, one size does not necessarily fit all. So which one do you want? When you've got multiple, even more virulent strains than the original uh, exploding around the world, does it make a difference? Let's find out. I'm going to start by saying this is an extremely fast-moving scientific landscape. No sooner have we approved a new vaccine than a new strain emerges, either here in Britain or those thought to originate in South Africa or Brazil. And each of those strains poses a different challenge for a vaccine because the part of the virus that's mutated is the infamous spike protein, which is exactly what many of the vaccines are designed to fight. Now, there are dozens of questions generally about vaccines, and I'm not going to try and answer them all again here. The film I made with Professor Altman is still very relevant, and I can also recommend this guide produced by the British Society for Immunology. See a question that's been troubling you here? What are COVID-19 vaccines made of? Will it change my DNA? Is it safe? Well, this free guide has the answers. The link to download it is in the description. There are a huge number of variables to consider when it comes to COVID vaccination. Uh, whether it's the nature of the vaccine itself being mRNA or viral vector, uh, the strain of the virus you might encounter, whether you've had one jab or two, uh, whether you've previously had an infection, and even your age. Let's try and cut through some of these, starting with age. Uh, you might have noticed headlines about certain countries not advocating use uh, of the AstraZeneca vaccine for older people, whether it's over the age of 55 or 65. Don't get misled by the headlines though. This isn't because the vaccine doesn't work for those age groups, just that certain advisory boards have deemed that there weren't enough people in those age groups in the trials to reach the statistical cutoff point to prove that the vaccine does work. And that was actually intentional by AstraZeneca, as they thought it was unethical to put the older at-risk groups in the firing line with the necessary control placebo. What evidence there is does suggest that the AZ vaccine does work perfectly well in these older groups. None of the other vaccines has observed any significant efficacy difference with age. So moving on, how protected are you after just one jab? Well, the latest data out of Israel, which has the highest per capita vaccination rate in the world, is that the Pfizer vaccine gives people about 90% protection against COVID after 21 days. Now, it is worth pointing out that the mechanism of the mRNA vaccine takes a while to build the body's immunity, and you are still very much at risk in the first couple of weeks after having the vaccine. We don't have reliable data yet for single-shot efficacy of the Moderna and AZ vaccines yet, but it will come. What we do have, though, is some data for what level of protection a single shot of vaccine gives to individuals who have previously had an infection. These two recent preprints from Kramer et al. and Sadat et al. show that the antibody response to the first vaccine dose in individuals with pre-existing immunity is equal to or even exceeds the titers found in naive individuals after the second dose. Basically, if you've had COVID and then get a shot of a vaccine, you'll have as good or better protection than those who've not been infected but had the two full shots at the correct intervals. Now, let's deal with the efficacy of the vaccines against the original Wuhan strain and the offshoot Italian strain. Basically, the two primary strains uh, which infected the world until November, December 2020. Both Pfizer and Moderna come in at about 95% efficacy. What does that mean? That only 5% of those vaccinated with two doses suffered some kind of SARS-2 infection when compared with the control groups. The data for Oxford AstraZeneca was a bit messy because of the dosing confusion in the original trials, but it looks like their vaccine's efficacy is 82% after both doses. One slight question remains over this figure. Trials were performed in the UK, South Africa, and Brazil. Given that these are the countries with the particularly virulent new strains, it's unclear how many of these variants uh, were affected with these results, uh, compared with trials performed in the US at the end of 2020, for example. Against solely the original strain, it's likely that the efficacy is around 90% as seen in the smaller UK subset. 
And in fact, uh, that dosing uh, issue got cleared up when they realized that the improvement in efficacy wasn't due to the dosing, but actually the interval that the second dose was given at. Uh, they found that it should have been given at 12 weeks rather than four weeks to, uh, to have maximum impact on the immune system. And what about the newer vaccines? Well, Russia's viral vector vaccine Sputnik looks to be a banger with an efficacy of 91.6%. And Novavax puts in an even stronger performance with a 95.6% efficacy against the original SARS-2 variant. And how about our final contender of the moment, Johnson & Johnson? 85% efficacy against the original strain. To have six vaccines a year on developing this level of performance against a novel coronavirus, and remember, we've never previously developed a vaccine for any coronavirus before, it's truly an incredible scientific and medical achievement. However much individual governments may have bungled their response to the pandemic, this is something that history will look rather more kindly upon. However, unfortunately, we're not just fighting the original D614 strain, or the Italian G variant anymore. We've also got B117, also known as the British strain, B1351, originally identified in South Africa, and B1128, originally identified in Brazil. For a bit more background on what these strains are and why they're so much more dangerous than the virus that caused the first wave of the pandemic, I've just covered it uh, in this film. If you've not seen this already, drop out and have a quick watch now and then come back. So how do our slate of mRNA and viral vector vaccines do against these new strains? First, the good news. Most of them do a pretty good job against the base B117 variants. That is to say, uh, the new British strain uh, without the recent E484K mutation. We don't have any data yet for the Pfizer vaccine, but its efficacy is said to be only modestly affected by B117. Same for Moderna. AstraZeneca's efficacy falls from 84% to 75% in these figures here, and Novavax falls from 95.6% to 85.6% against the British strain. But how about the South African and Brazilian variants? Well, a small-scale trial found that the viral vector approach of AstraZeneca struggled against the E484K mutation, efficacy falling to what this trial found was only 10%. But again, this is very early data and only a small sample. Another study found the Pfizer jab doing rather better, but uh, this article in Nature uh, was a study that was done in a lab environment with an engineered virus. Novavax, meanwhile, manages 60% efficacy against the B1351 variant in the wild, and similar figures for J&J. &J. But just to add complexity to something I've been trying to simplify, how does a single shot of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine protect you against the B1351 South African variant if you've already had the virus before? The answer, surprisingly, is extremely well. So that's rather excellent news. What's not clear is which variant these people had had the first time round. Are natural antibodies to the Wuhan or Italian strain different to the antibodies created battling the South African or Brazilian variants? I guess in due course, we'll find out. So forgive this slightly budget interlude, but uh, just before putting this video up, I thought it was worth mentioning the subject of long COVID and vaccination, because one of the questions I get asked most commonly is, should I take the vaccine if I'm having long COVID symptoms? If the body is already in this hyperactive immune state uh, with all kinds of inflammatory responses, what's gonna happen uh, when we inject something that's designed to trigger the immune system? Well, I'm running a short survey at the moment to find out whether people who've had either the AstraZeneca, Moderna or Pfizer jabs have experienced any negative reactions in the first week, two weeks or thereafter. The early results are looking promising and I would certainly say to any long hauler at this stage who's thinking of taking the vaccine or, or has the opportunity to do so, uh, to go ahead and do it because it does seem to be pretty well tolerated. But full results to come uh, in my next film. There's one point that I haven't yet covered regarding vaccine efficacy. Efficacy is measured by the proportion of people who test PCR positive. But as someone who's suffered from long COVID for almost a year, I can tell you that not all COVID-19 infections are created equal. Just testing PCR positive doesn't mean the vaccine has failed. 
What the vaccines are intending to do, besides impacting on the spread of the virus, is to manage the individual's immune response. And when it comes to that, there's really only one chart that matters. This one. So in these terms, it doesn't really matter which vaccine you get. Every single one of them offers complete protection from serious disease and death. We don't know about protection from long COVID, time will tell on that front. In practical terms, you may also not actually have a choice about which vaccine you take. That choice will be made for you depending on where you live and what deals have been done by your government. Having this many effective vaccines really is great news in terms of our ability to take on the virus and the pandemic worldwide. And as for the new ultra-virulent strains, despite already to some degree being factored in with these numbers from the clinical trials, modified vaccines specifically designed to take them down are already in development. We should have them by the autumn. So for the first time in over a year, the future's actually not looking too bad. As long as everyone takes the vaccine, that is. I'll address vaccine hesitancy in another film. In the meantime, look after yourselves. Until next time.